So we've reached our final topic for the course and this topic titled Internet Security is really a couple of examples that uh, show some of the cryptographic mechanisms being used in, in practice. So uh, in securing internet communications which we use on a regular basis I'll go through really two examples, one securing web traffic and one using secure shell if we get time just at the end to demonstrate some of the communication protocols used. So uh, HTTPS we'll use as, as an example which we all use. We want to see how it works and also when we go through and see how the protocols work we'll see the algorithms coming into play. The public key algorithms like RSA and Diffie-Hellman uh, the symmetric key algorithms, max will come up and others. So we'll finish with these examples and we'll focus on web security. But first, all right, some, some general issues with web security. So, uh, and when I say web security, I mean browsing websites, but in fact some of these comments still apply to any type of internet application, maybe email security, uh, security of instant messaging applications, line and so on. So similar uh, issues arise. So we're, with applications that we use in the internet, the internet has been around for uh, 40 plus years, and the protocols that are used to communicate between computers uh, and which the main one being IP, the internet protocol, and another main one being TCP, the transmission control protocol, they were designed many years ago, 30 or 40 years ago. And they were designed assuming that the network that uh, the users were using was, had no malicious users. Okay, so the protocols for that we use in the internet today, which were designed a long time ago, were designed with no security in mind. They assumed that there was no one malicious. And in those days there was no one malicious. The only users of the internet were the, the academics and the researchers that were using the network. No one was uh, maliciously intercepting traffic. There was no commercial transactions. So the design was appropriate for those days. But those protocols, IP, TCP, for web browsing, HTTP and many others, most of them were designed with no security mechanism built in. But of course as the internet grew and the number of users and, and the different usage applications uh, uh, grew, then some security issues started to arise and malicious users started to be more prevalent. So many threats uh, arise from people using these applications and unfortunately the protocols we were using didn't support security. So the security issues in the internet really if we think about the three locations where they arise, the, the computers which are communicating which we refer to normally as the client and server, can we keep the client computer secure, the disk, the, the memory, can we keep the sec server computer secure and also what's sent between the client and the server. So imagine your phone with a web browser talking to a computer with a web server. The th security issues that arise relate to securing your phone, the client, securing the server, and securing the traffic between your client and server. And there are many different techniques that are tried to secure those three. We're going to focus on the traffic between client and server not how to make sure that no one can log into your phone but to look at the techniques to ensure that if someone sends data from client to server that someone in the middle cannot intercept and see the data or modify the data without it being detected. There are different techniques to secure the traffic and those techniques primarily are add-ons. Add-ons to the original protocols. So the original protocols being IP, TCP, HTTP, which had no security features, people have created optional extras that you can use with IP, TCP and HTTP to add security. 
and we'll look at several of them, not, not all, but for example, to add security to the internet protocol, there's an extension called IPsec. It allows you to encrypt your IP datagrams. To add security to your tr TCP traffic, there's an extension or an extra protocol called Secure Sockets Layer or the Transport Layer Security, SSL or TLS. And also there are different protocols for specific applications like logins and email. This table shows some of the, the problems that can arise with internet security and we'll not go through all of them. I think some are, or most are obvious. Uh, returning back to our, one of our first lectures, we remember we talked about CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and the A was availability. And availability relates to denial of service. The fourth row in this table, authentication, we sometimes combine with integrity. So this table is showing if we want to keep our data confidential, what are potential things that can go wrong? What are the threats? For example, someone can listen in on the network and see our data eavesdropping on the net. If someone does that, what are the consequences? Well, I may lose information, that is others can access that information or I lose privacy. What are the things that we use to stop those consequences from arising? What are the countermeasures? Well, we encrypt our data. We know in general if you want to send data across a network, it should be encrypted. For privacy, there are other techniques like web proxies. For integrity, how do we ensure integrity? We use checksums. Well, checksums, what are they? Message authentication codes, hash functions, the techniques we've looked at. To provide authentication, well, we've got different cryptographic techniques. What's the one we looked at most recently? How do we provide authentication in web browsing? How do we authenticate the server? Certificates, okay, so the previous topic we finished looking at digital certificates where a server has a certificate which includes its public key and it's signed by some trusted authority. So the browser, when it gets that certificate, can authenticate and check that it's communicating with the right server. So that's one of the cryptographic techniques used for authentication. So checksums, like message authentication codes, we've covered it in the topic, used for integrity, hash functions, used for integrity, Similar and, and digital certificates used for authentication, encryption, mainly symmetric key encryption, but sometimes public key encryption used for confidentiality. <laughs> to deal with denial of service attacks, well, we don't have any simple cryptographic techniques that we can rely on. It's something slightly different from what we've talked about in this course. Denial of service attacks are meaning our computer system is no longer available for its intended purpose. It's overloaded. The network is overloaded, the server is overloaded by an attacker. That's hard to prevent. So there's a different area of study to look at how to stop and, and deal with denial of service attacks, which we don't cover in this course. So those are some of the general threats that arise in internet or web security and some of the countermeasures that we can use. We're going to look mainly at one example and, and if time this week or even next week, one uh, small example of an application level security. This topic requires some of your background knowledge on the internet because we're looking at how uh, internet security works and, and some of the protocols we use in the internet. We, when we look at the protocols used for communications in the internet, we organize them in a layered stack or a layered architecture. We think about what do the applications use to communicate. For example, a web browser application uses what protocol? Web browser uses which protocol? HTTP, web browser uses HTTP. Your uh, email client, SMTP is used, you may have heard of others like POP and IMAP. 
Right? You, maybe when you configure your device, you need to choose POP or IMAP to connect to the email server. So they are the, some protocols used by email applications. Uh, remote login applications for me to remotely connect to another server or computer. What protocols are used? And you've probably done it in some of your homework tasks. You connect into another computer like the ICT server. SSH is an application layer protocol to remotely connect to another computer. An older one was Telnet. So the many different applications we have on the internet often have their own protocols for communicating, called the application layer protocols. But many of those protocols, so in this first picture, HTTP, for example, for web browsing, SMTP for email, FTP for file transfer, downloading large files normally, and many others sit up here. Many of them require the same functionality. And one of those functions that they require is reliability. I send a piece of data across the internet. I want to make sure it gets there correctly. It's not lost. And in the internet, the main protocol used to provide reliability is TCP. TCP allows us to set up a connection from client to server and ensures that our data will be delivered correctly. TCP uh, is a transport layer protocol. Another one which is less commonly used is UDP as a transport layer protocol. But TCP is used by your web browser, your email client, your remote login software, your database client, and many other applications. And everything is sent across the internet using the internet protocol, IP. And that provides the addressing, IP addresses, and the basic format of the packet to, to be forwarded through the, through the internet. <clears throat> so a quick summary that we have application layer protocols, specific to applications. We have transport layer protocols, TCP and UDP are the main ones. And then, then we have a network layer protocol called IP, which is used by all of the others. So then the question arises, I want to securely communicate between applications client to server, where do I add the security mechanisms? And there are three options shown in these diagrams, three examples. The first one, which we call network layer security or le network level security, we take the IP datagram and secure that. That is, my web browser generates a HTTP message. It's sent using TCP and IP, then that IP datagram is encrypted. So we add a feature to IP to provide security of those IP packets. And that feature is referred as IPsec. It's an optional extra. We don't need it, but it, it's available. It provides a general solution for securing internet traffic. That is, every application, irrespective of what protocol they're using or what transport protocol, because they all use IP, if IPsec is enabled, all of their data can be secured. The problem with IPsec in practice is it's not widely used. That is, well, why is it what not, not widely used? It usually requires some configuration from the end user's perspective. You and I, when we want to secure our web browsing traffic, if we want to use IPsec, we may need to set up our computers in advance and set up the server in advance. And most normal users don't have the ability to do that or don't want to have to spend the time to doing some manual configuration. So we see for applications, IPsec is not so commonly used. It is used for things like virtual private networks. You want to connect securely from your phone into a, uh, the SIT network, then you can use IPsec to do that, and that's a bit more common. So network layer security secures all of the IP packets using IPsec. Another option is transport level security, where we secure just the TCP packets. It only applies that we're, in the case we're looking at to TCP. Every application that uses TCP, which is many, web browsing, email, databases, many applications use TCP, 
what we do is we encrypt the TCP packets and provide some other security mechanisms. And again, there's an optional extra protocol that does that for us. And the old name was Secure Sockets Layer, SSL. The newer version is called Transport Layer Security, or TLS. We'll list in one slide later uh, those in a bit more depth. But in this lecture, you'll see sometimes I'll use either of those, SSL or TLS, to mean the same thing. There are slight differences between them, but uh, at one point in time, they were identical. SSL was the old name. TLS is the newer version. The idea is that it doesn't matter what application you're using, as long as it uses TCP as a transport protocol, we can secure that traffic between client and server. And that, that usually doesn't require anything from the user to set up. You don't need to configure your computer beforehand to use SSL. It's done automatically. And that means it's widely used today. So we use that as a, a major example in this topic. The third approach is application level security. For a specific application, we add some extensions to that application protocol to secure the traffic. An example in this picture is for email. Email traffic, when we send packets for email, is using a protocol called SMTP. And normally, the email messages sent between email servers are not encrypted. There's an extension to SMTP, or an add-on called SMIME, which allows us to encrypt the email messages. This is only for email. SMIME is not used for other applications, just for email. So here's an example where we add security extensions to specific applications. Any questions? So we've got three alternatives. The application-specific techniques are only relevant for an individual application, it means that we need to add, upgrade each application if we want to use them. The transport level techniques are only relevant for TCP-based applications. But it turns out that many applications use TCP, so that is a widely used solution. The IPsec security works for all applications, but because it requires some configuration from the user's perspective, it's not so widely used. We will focus on the transport level security as an example. TLS, SSL. And as a specific example of TLS and SSL, we'll use web browsing as the application, because that's widely used as well. So how do we sec support secure web browsing? What protocol do we use? Secure web browsing. HTTPS. Okay, I think you know when you use your browser, you see that HTTPS and the padlock. That is the protocol used for secure web browsing, as opposed to just normal HTTP. So we'll look at that as the example. It turns out that HTTPS is simply normal HTTP, but using SSL and TLS. So we'll focus on SSL and TLS. the naming or the history. Originally, uh, the Netscape web browser, uh, one of the, the early widely used web browsers, implemented the extensions for securing web traffic. And that was called Secure Sockets Layer, SSL. So it was only implemented in Netscape, but it became popular in other web browsers, like Internet Explorer started to add the features. and. It went through multiple versions, SSL version 1, version 2, and so on. And at some point, a standards organization called IETF said, let's make it a standard so everyone uses it. And they named that standard Transport Layer Security, TLS. At that point in time, SSL and TLS were the same, were essentially the same. So just two different names for the same technique. 
Uh, so SSL version 3 and TLS are about the same. TLS has gone through different versions, like version 1, 1.1, 1.2. So as TLS is changing now, SSL is no longer being updated. But in, in reality, we'll use, well, in reality, people use SSL and TLS to mean about the same thing. And in this course, when I say SSL or TLS, I mean the same thing. We will not look at the differences between them. Both are still widely used as the name. I'll probably use SSL when I speak. What does SSL do? It allows applications that, that use TCP to use some additional security services. Security services, what do I mean by that? Encrypt is one. An application normally sends data to the TCP software. Before we send that data to TCP, we encrypt it so that if someone intercepts the data, they cannot see the original content. So encryption is one service, but we know to encrypt we need a key, and if we need a key, we need to do some key exchange up front. So SSL also provides the ability to do a key exchange. And we also know with key exchanges, we need to be sure we're communicating with the right entity. We need to authenticate. So SSL provides ability to do authentication as well. SSL is quite complex. There are many different components to it. So we'll see in some of the next slides some of the details and that it actually consists of multiple sub-protocols. So there's not just one communication protocol, it's made up of different parts. What we will do in this lecture is uh, rather briefly present some of the overview of SSL. You will not be required to remember all the details, but then we'll go through an example of SSL and you'll see uh, some of the, the, the details arise. So the overview of SSL is shown in this picture. Normally your application, in this example, the web browser, your application uses an application level protocol like HTTP. Without SSL, the HTTP message is sent using TCP, which in turn uses IP to send the data across the internet. That's without SSL. With SSL, we have an additional protocol called the record protocol that does the encryption of the data. So instead of sending the HTTP message directly using TCP, we send the HTTP message using the SSL record protocol, which will encrypt it, add a checksum or add a message authentication code for integrity. So that's the role of the record protocol to encrypt our data and to add max for our data. But to set that up, so that both endpoints know which encryption algorithms to use, they know which keys to use, there are some other techniques. So there's a handshake protocol for SSL. Before we send any data, we must agree between client and server what algorithms to use, what parameters to use. Do we use AES to encrypt? Do we use RSA for public key certificates or some other algorithm? And that's the role of the handshake protocol, to exchange those initial parameters and uh, set up the secure connection. Then we can encrypt with the record protocol. So they're the main ones we'll look at. Also, it turns out what we do with SSL is we use one algorithm for encryption for some steps, and then we may change the cipher to another one. For example, for the key exchange, we may use Diffie-Hellman. And then for the data exchange, we may use AES. So we may change the cipher during the connection. So there's a protocol for changing the cipher to say to the other side, let's change the other one now. And the last one, if something goes wrong or there are warning messages, for example, the client sends a message to the server, the server cannot decrypt it, or the message authentication fails then there's an alert message 
or an alert protocol for the server to send back a message to the client, something went wrong, warning or error message. Sometimes it's just for notification, it's not an error, it's just to inform the other side about some event. So the main one is the record protocol and to support that we need to go through the handshake to agree upon the, the algorithms. Before we look into more details of that, let's look at an example of using web browsing. So we'll use that as our uh, example throughout our study of SSL. And we access a website. For example, I ask, access the index.html page on the ICT server using normal HTTP. I've done it before and I, if I record the messages being sent, for example, I capture the packets which were sent from my web browser to the web server, we can look at those messages to see how the uh, communications took place. When we're using web browsing, the application level protocol is HTTP and the transport level protocol is TCP. I've got a record of the packets from a past uh, class where I recorded what was sent between my browser and server. So we'll look at them just to remind us how web browsing works. And it's a slightly different example. It's, it's a bit old, but I think you'll see the idea here. This is, and those that have taken the lab or my course last semester will know this is the software called Wireshark, which shows us the list of packets sent between some computers. And in this example, so we've got the first two columns identifying the source computer and the destination computer. In this particular example, the source computer was my laptop or office computer. I can't remember. It was done a couple of years ago. And the destination computer was, I think, the ICT server. ICT or IT, I, again, I can't remember, not so relevant. So the source computer of 10.10.99.251 was my computer. The destination of 203.131.209.72 was the IP address of the server at that point in time. So what I did is I accessed the website, and these were the messages that were sent between browser and server. There were seven recorded. If we look at just the HTTP messages, we see how HTTP as an application layer protocol works. The source browser computer sent to the server a HTTP message and we call this a HTTP GET request. It is the browser telling the server, I want to get the page slash it.html. So at that time, I accessed a page called it.html. I send a request for that page. And the second message we see is the server sending the response back. The server, the address starting with 203, sending a response to the my browser computer. And the response says everything is OK, 200 OK. What is inside this response message? If when I open up the response message, what am I going to see? When I open the response, I'll see the reply, but what's inside that? What's the main thing in the response? It says OK, meaning the status of this request was OK, but there's a thing we want in there. The data, what is the data? It's the web page. Right? With web browsing, I send a request to the server, I want it.html. The server sends back a response inside that response. There are many things, but the one thing that's of importance to the user, if I look at that response in detail, the contents of that include the, the web page, the, the HTML that was in the file it.html. So that's the, 
normal operation for HTTP. Send a request for a web page, get the web page in response. What port number does our web server use? Port 80. So port numbers are used to identify applications and server applications usually use a fixed port number. A web server by default uses port 80. So here we see our protocols. The application layer protocol is HTTP. The transport layer protocol is TCP. And the network layer protocol is IP. They're the ones of interest to us. There's no security here. Not yet. Here, these pack two messages are HTTP messages. But in fact, there were some other things that happened as well. What are these three messages? Some of you are taking a class with Dr. Comwood, and I'm sure in his, his exam in the next couple of weeks he'll ask about this. What are these, the first three messages shown in this list of packets? The handshake. It's called a TCP three-way handshake. So this is the first part of my browser, remember, 10.10.99.251, connecting to the server. Before we transfer any data, we actually set up a connection. And the normal way to set up a connection, we're using the protocol TCP. We send a special message to the server saying, I want to synchronize you with you, a SYN message. The server sends back a response saying, I acknowledge that you want to synchronize with me, and I also want to synchronize with you. And the third message is the browser sends back to the server, I acknowledge that SYN message you sent to me. SYN, SYNAC, ACK. That's the three-way handshake with TCP. We all always see that before we transfer data. This is to set them to let them know that they're about to communicate. Yep. So when you um, call to a website, mm -hmm. any computer can go into this website. Mm -hmm. Why why do you need this handshake? Uh, why do we need this handshake? TCP uh, the, the protocol TCP has several main uh, services. One thing that TCP does for us is when I send data, say from my browser to the server, I don't know if it got there. Right? Maybe something went wrong in the internet. So I, don't, yeah, so I don't know if data got there. So what we'll normally do is we'll expect an acknowledgement to come back to say your data got there. If it doesn't, we, uh, we may have to resend that data. The other thing TCP does is if the client sends data too fast for the server, it may overflow the server. So there are some mechanisms for the data transfer that require uh, some initialization of parameters at the client and server. And that's the ro role of the connection setup, to synchronize some initial values so that they are aware we're about to transfer data. So every application that uses TCP will use this to set up. Once we've set up, then our browser sends data to the server. The data in this case is the HTTP message. Even though the protocol listed here says it's HTTP, that message is actually a TCP message, but the data inside that is the HTTP request for that web page. This one, coming from server to browser, is just a TCP act saying, thank you for your data. Browser sends data to the server. Server sends back an acknowledgment saying, thank you. Everything was OK. The next message is data going from server to browser. The data is our web page, the it.html page. And the last one shown here is an act coming from browser to server saying, thank you for that data. The point being is that from the application's perspective, HTTP, 
If we filter just for those messages, it's a request and a response. But to support that, there's actually a TCP connection set up at the start. And for each data message, there's also some acts. So sometimes we'll hide the TCP messages. Sometimes we'll show them. To be clear, let's just draw that so everyone remembers the structure. When we're using HTTP, we have our browser talking to the server. And the exchange of messages we see, we see there's a three-way handshake at the start, sin, sin, ak, and ak. So with the three messages, I'll just uh, summarize them as the sin message, the TCP sin, the sin ak that comes back from the server, and the final third message in that handshake called an ACK. This is to set up the TCP connection before we transfer any data. Then we send some data. And the data, when we're using web browsing, is the request for the web page. And I'll just list that as the HTTP request or the in our case, a HTTP GET message, meaning I want to get a particular web page. Most of you know this already. You're experts on HTTP. There's an acknowledgment that come back, comes back saying, Thank you for that data. And then eventually the server sends back the web page. I'll denote as the HTTP response. And there was a final act that we saw there saying, thank you for that data. And I say most of you know this. And if you don't, you will have trouble in your exam this week in your lab class. Any questions on HTTP so far? No security yet. But what we want to look at is when we use web browsing, how do we secure the communications? We have a request for a page, we get the response, but to support that we need to set up a connection at the start and we sometimes have some acts coming back. What we want to do is, from a security perspective, ensure all the data sent using TCP, in our case the HTTP GET and the HTTP RESPONSE, we want that to be secure. By secure I mean encrypted and authenticated. That is, make sure that when we receive it, it hasn't been modified along the way. So that's the role of SSL in this case. With SSL, we do some extra steps to ensure that we can encrypt this TCP data, the HTTP GET and, and RESPONSE. So with SSL, the HTTP GET and RESPONSE will be encrypted with the record protocol. But before we use that, we must do an additional handshake, another setup to say, let's agree upon some security parameters. The TCP handshake is to agree upon the, just the TCP parameters. But in addition, we will need a SSL handshake to agree upon the security algorithms and the keys to use. So we'll see that come up soon.
Just some terminology that we may see in the, the example that comes up. We saw when a client connects to the server, we create a TCP connection. We set up that connection with that first three-way handshake. We send some data. What I didn't show in the example is that when we finish sending data, we may close the connection. We, we skipped over that uh, closing part. There's also a concept of an SSL connection, which directly corresponds to a TCP connection. So we can say that we have a TCP connection from browser to server, and we can also have an SSL connection from browser to server. But in SSL, there's another level as well. There's called an SSL session. In an SSL session, again, between client and server, we will do a handshake. We'll agree upon the parameters to use, the, the algorithms, the keys. That will be part of setting up the session. And once we set up a session, then we can have multiple connections associated that, with that one session. The idea is I set up my secure session between my browser on my computer and the web server. And then I transfer some data securely. And maybe a little bit later, I have another TCP connection using the same session parameters, the same session. So we can have multiple SSL or TCP connections associated with a single session. We don't have to set up the secure session every time we want to create a TCP connection. There's an overhead of setting up the, the secure session, so we want to avoid that. And we can do that with sessions and connections. So we will see that come up in the, one of the examples. So at the start of a session, we'll perform a handshake, agree upon some parameters. Once we perform the handshake, both the client and server will record information about this session. Some of the information they'll record is there'll be an ID of the session, something that uniquely identifies it. When there are certificates used, they'll be recorded, so saved in memory at the client and server. Uh, the algorithms used for compression, although not part of security, will often compress the data. The cipher spec will list the, the set of ciphers that we use. For example, the symmetric key cipher, the MAC algorithm, uh, the, the public key cipher will be listed and recorded. And the secrets will be stored. So there will be a master secret, but there will be also some other secret keys. So these are the keys. These will be stored for the session. And for each connection, a session may contain multiple connections, the, sp the specific keys will be stored. So what we'll do, we'll have one master key. Actually, there may be two master keys, we'll see. And they'll be used to generate session keys. Now, the terminology is a bit confusing. The session keys here refer to as encrypt keys and MAC secrets. And there may be sequence numbers to keep track of the messages we've sent, give them in order. Initialization vectors, we remember from the modes of operation, CBC and, and other modes, we often had an initial value. That value will be stored. And often we will need some random values, say for nonces or to, to set up the, the initial session. So they'll be stored at the client and server. So the idea we establish a secure session using a handshake protocol, store this information at both client and server. Then the data that we send between client and server will be encrypted and authenticated using a MAC. Let's see some of the steps involved there. First, how do we encrypt the data? And this summarizes the operation of the record protocol. What we're talking about with the record protocol is after we've set up a secure session, after some handshake, we have data to send. For example, our HTTP GET message is considered data. I want to send it from my browser to the server, but I want to send it securely. So the record protocol takes that data, that entire HTTP GET message, 
and does this with it. So if we consider we start with the application data, say the HTTP GET message, we go through these steps. The data may be, may be different sizes in different applications. So first we fragment it. We split it into equally sized fragments. And the size will be defined for the, the, the session. It's usually, uh, I think we'll see maybe 128 bytes or, or of that similar to 128 bytes. We split the application into equal sized fragments. If my application data was 1,000 bytes, then we'd get our eight fragments. If it was 10,000 bytes, we'd have more fragments. For each fragment of data, we then apply the following operations. And it's shown just for the first fragment, but these operations apply to each fragment. We compress the fragment. It provides no security, but it uh, may improve the performance of the data transfer because if the fragment can be compressed, we can uh, save some space or the amount that we need to transfer. Compression is actually optional. We may compress with what's called the null algorithm, meaning don't compress. But we'll see that we have the option to compress. We take that compressed data and calculate a message authentication code. Remember the purpose of a MAC is so that the receiver can verify the integrity of the data. If a MAC is attached, then the receiver gets this compressed fragment and the MAC, and the receiver checks, does the MAC of the compressed fragment match the MAC received? So we've covered that concept in the topic on message authentication codes. What does a MAC take as input? What is the MAC user's input? Here it uses the compressed fragment and, importantly, a MAC takes two things as input. If you go back to your slides on MACs, you'll see the MAC function takes data as input and a key, a secret. For authentication, MACs use a secret key and the data. If, when we looked at hash functions, they just apply on data, but MAC functions also have a secret key. So there is a MAC secret that is needed to perform this operation. So when the client has its compressed fragment, the data, it calculates a MAC using that data and a secret key, and that secret key, of course, must also be known by the server. So that will be one parameter stored and known and agreed upon from the handshake. So it's referred to the MAC secrets here. We take that compressed fragment with the MAC attached at the end and then encrypt all of it. What's an encrypt function take as input? What's an encrypt function take? A key and the data. So that what do we encrypt? We encrypt this component and we use a key to encrypt that and we're using symmetric key encryption to encrypt here. For example, AES may be used but others may be used. So there's also an encrypt key or an encrypt secret. So in fact there are two, two secret keys here. One that's used for max and another that is used for encrypting the data and they're usually different and random values. And so we have two keys that both the client and server needs to know here, one for a MAC, one for an encrypt. And to add some more complexity, for the direction from client to server, we use one set of keys. And from server back to client, we'll use a different set. So in fact, there are four keys now. MAC key for one direction, client to server. A MAC key from server back to client and also encrypt key for client to server and encrypt key for server back to client. How do we get these keys? Anyone want to guess? How do we generate our MAC secrets or our encrypt keys? Mm 
random. Okay, so they with symmetric key encryption and they should be random values. So if our client generates a random value, how does the server know it? We may need some ex key exchange to send the value to the, the server. Well, we don't do that for each of those four values. We don't do it for the encrypt keys and max secrets. We we'll actually have a master key. So we'll say generate a master secret key, perform a key exchange of that master secret. We'll see an example using Diffie-Hellman. And then once both the client and server have that master secret key, they will use an, a known algorithm to generate encrypt keys and MAC secrets. So we use the master to generate the other sub keys. And the algorithm they use is usually applying a hash of some, some known values. So the encrypt keys and MAC secrets are generated from the master key. The master key is the important one there. How do we get the master key at both sides? We'll see that in the, the handshake protocol. So we've encrypted our authenticated compressed fragment. The last thing we do is we add a small header to the front indicating the, the fragment order. That this is fragment number one, and the next fragment, and so on, and to in indicate that this is using SSL. It's called append the, the record header. Fragmentation, there are some limits on the, the size. Compression, you may have an algorithm or it may be a null algorithm, that is no compression. It's lossless compression. We can't compress data and throw parts away. It's, it's not lossy. Uh, the MAC is normally we use HMAC and there's a secret used in the MAC. Encrypt, we have a, a secret as well, a separate secret than the MAC one. And the SSL record header includes a few fields like the version of SSL we're using, what content type is included in here, and uh, the length of that message, the compressed length. Shown in sort of summary version there, the, the entire SSL message there contains the plain text, optionally compressed, then the MAC is attached, and then all of that is encrypted. And then we add some header, header fields at the start. That will be sent across the network instead of the original HTTP GET message. That was for the record protocol for when we send data. There's also some additional uh, uh, structure of the messages for the handshake, the change cipher protocol, and the alert protocol, which are listed here but not relevant for what we want to, the detail that we need to discuss. Yes? Right. Ah, right. So where, where does this occur? Uh, so the application data comes from your application, so your web browser, for example. Your web browser, you click on a link, your web browser generates this HTTP GET request. That is what we list as the application data here. Normally that is then sent to your operating system and without SSL, that application data is sent to your OS and your OS uses the TCP software to send, uh, to set up a connection and to send the data. What we do with SSL, there's something else inserted between your application and the operating system. And that something else, it may be implemented in the application or more commonly nowadays it's a separate library or a separate piece of software on your computer that your application generates the data, sends to this library that implements SSL, that library software on your computer fragments, compresses, adds the MAC, encrypts, generates this SSL fragment, sends that to your operating system. 
So the application data comes from your application. The end result of all of this goes to the operating system and is then sent using TCP. So these steps are done by the SSL software on your computer. What SSL software? What's the name of some SSL software, a library that you use? OpenSSL, you've used on the command line, is actually intended for this purpose. It's built to uh, originally to provide a library to insert between an application and your operating system to do all of these steps. We've just used it on the command line, but it's more commonly used automatically by applications. So to visualize that, that was the exchange with HTTP. Let's draw a different perspective. From the client's perspective, with HTTP, we start with our application, so our browser. generate some HTTP GET request. This is our application data. And it sends that to our operating system. I'll draw it down here so we can compare. And the operating system then sends a, a TCP message. TCP data. That's the normal ap approach. Browser generates application data, HTTP GET request, for example. It's sent to the operating system, which generates a TCP data message. Actually, before it generates the TCP data, it does the TCP connection and then generates data and sent. What about with HTTPS? Well, our browser does the same. There's nothing different. Generates the HTTP GET. That's the application data. But then we have the SSL software in the middle, the SSL library. And that sends the I'll say the encrypted fragments. Encrypted fragments to the operating system. So the operating system or the TCP part of the operating system receives these encrypted fragments and it just treats it as data and sends as TCP data But the data is, of course, encrypted and authenticated. It's not the unencrypted or the plain text from the application. So SSL, we insert this extra component or layer between application and operating system. The SSL software, maybe it comes with your browser. So maybe it's provided by your browser, or maybe it's a separate piece of software on your computer, a library, a standalone library. It depends upon your system. Yeah? So the question, why do we use port 443? So you're jumping ahead. Uh, let's see the slides come back to the handshake later. We, no, we're talking about SSL in general, but the example of SSL we're using, and it's the widely used one, is HTTPS. Okay, so HTTPS is an example of an application using SSL. HTTPS, all it is, send your HTTP messages using SSL. So what's the difference? Well, I think you know from the URL perspective, your uh, URLs start with HTTPS as opposed to simply HTTP. That tells your browser 
whether to use normal HTTP or the secure HTTPS. That is, if, you, if the URL includes HTTPS, your browser knows send this HTTP GET request to the SSL software. Don't send it direct to TCP in the operating system. When your web server receives requests, again, the web server may receive requests using the normal HTTP and be processed and sent back, or it may be receive requests using HTTPS. And the way that the web server distinguishes between them is using a port number. So when the browser sends a the first message to the web server, a web server normally receives on what's called port 80 with HTTP, but a separate port number, port 443, for a secure web server, HTTPS. Why do we have two different ports? What's the answer? You ask the question, why, why need two different ports? What do port numbers use for? <laughs> to be not ambiguous between applications. That is, we now have two, two different applications on the web server, really. The, the one that handles normal HTTP and the one that handles HTTPS. They, they are treated separately. So we actually have two different port numbers there. So that's some of the details of the implementation of the web server. While we're here, what else? Uh, we will see when we use SSL to send our HTTP GET request and to receive the response back, everything is encrypted. What does everything include? The URL. Remember, in the get message, it says get slash it.html. But that is encrypted, so if someone intercepts that, they don't know the specific page you're accessing. They don't know if you're accessing it.html or abc.html. So that component is encrypted. The, the file is encrypted. Someone still knows the server you're accessing. Right? You cannot hide the server you're accessing, because that's identified by the IP address, but you hide the, the rest of the part of the, the URL. The contents of the web page are, of course, encrypted. So when someone sends back it.html, all of that's encrypted, so someone cannot see the contents of the web page you're accessing. When you access a website and it has a form, you fill in the form and press submit, all of that data which is submitted with the form would be encrypted. So no one can see the data. When you type in your username and password and press login, that is implemented with a form, that would be encrypted. Websites often use cookies so that the website can track your recent communications, keep track of your uh, c communications with this website. Those cookies are sent using HTTP, so they are also encrypted using HTTPS. And the HTTP messages contain headers, and sometimes that gives revealing information. That is all encrypted. So if someone intercepts using HTTPS, they cannot see any of this information. But if you're using HTTP, if someone intercepts your communications, they can see all of this. Let's go back. We'll see what we got to and uh, set up for the handshake. Our picture. HTTP using a browser direct to the operating system. HTTPS, we have SSL software in the middle. This is an example. If I, gener I wrote my own game application, I want to create a new game. I write the game client and the game server not using HTTP, but they communicate using my own protocol, then I could have the communications between the game client and server secure using SSL. I would have my game software, my game client, that generates messages to be sent to the game server. Instead of me encrypting those messages inside my game client software, I simply send those messages to the SSL software, which sets up the secure connection and encrypts them for me. So that's one of the benefits of transport layer security. 
the application doesn't have to implement that security. And the application developer doesn't have to implement that security. You leave it to an existing library which is well, uh, being well tested and, and is shown to be secure uh, in as many cases as possible. So when you develop your own application, you can use SSL to provide security across the network. Before we can do any encryption and, and applying the MAC, we must agree upon parameters. And that's the role of the handshake protocol. So we'll briefly summarize the steps. And then after a break, we'll go through an example. But let's just summarize the steps first. What's the purpose of the handshake protocol? Two main things. We want to perform authentication. We would like to be allow, allow the client to be sure it's talking with the correct server, and also sometimes for the server to be sure it's talking to the correct client. So the authentication of both sides is supported with SSL, and it's done in the handshake protocol. And we often need to negotiate or agree upon algorithms we're going to use and keys we're going to use, and as well as other parameters. So that's the other purpose of the handshake agree upon what algorithm we'll use for key exchange. For example, RSA or Diffie-Hellman. What algorithm are we going to use for the MAC? And the two common ones that we use HMAC with either SHA or MD5. And what are we going to use for encryption? And you can choose from many different ciphers to encrypt symmetric key encryption. So there are some messages that happen in the handshake protocols that both client and server will agree upon these values. And the handshake protocol goes through four general phases. First, we establish the capabilities of each other. The client proposes algorithms to the server. The server chooses one. That is, the client will say, I can support RSA and Diffie-Hellman for key exchange. I can support HMAC with MD5. And I can support RC4, DES, and AES for encryption. The client will send that information to the server. The server will choose one of those, which of course it also supports. So the server may support multiple. It will choose the highest one as preferred by the client and send back a response saying, let's use this set. So it's not one algorithm, it's a set of algorithms for key exchange, MAC and encryption, also compression. So they agree upon algorithms. Then there's authentication of the server. The client wants to be sure it's talking with the correct server. How do we do that? Commonly? Certificates. The server can send its certificate to my client and the client can verify the certificate. We'll see that's common with web browsing. And key exchange. What key are we going to use for encrypt? So we'll actually exchange a master key usually and then use that to generate other keys. Step three, we may, and this is not used for HTTPS, but it's, it's possible that the server can authenticate the client. That is, the client sends its certificate to the server, and the server verifies that it's talking with the correct client. So that's also supported. We don't normally use this step three for web browsing. Because to authenticate a client with web browsing, we usually use forms and logins. So we don't use certificates, but it's supported by SSL. Then we do some final exchange to say we've set up the connection. And after that, we apply the record protocol and encrypt all of our data. So with HTTPS, we're going to see an example where we see the step of phase one, phase two, there will not be client authentication, and finally we'll finish setting up the connection. There are many different message types sent. Let's just list them. This summarizes the main exchange in those four phases. The client and server establish capabilities sending hello messages. Client says hello, server says hello back. The server authentication, the server sends a certificate and then some messages to 
perform a key exchange and then is eventually done. And if there's client authentication, it's not necessary, but if there is, the server may request a certificate, the client sends a certificate, and there's a key exchange and a final verification. Usually we will see there's only one message here, the key exchange. The certificate is not sent. Then at the end, to finish up, they say, let's change from this previous cipher we've used, and now let's start encrypting our data with AES or the, the encrypt cipher chosen. And they both do that. They say, let's change the cipher to the new one. I've finished the set, set up of the session. After phase four, now we send our encrypted data. This is easier to see with a more detailed example. And we'll use the example of web browsing to see this exchange. And we'll look at a capture of web browsing. 